So this you will agree that if I just square it here, it does not make a difference. It is a positive number. Wherever that positive number is minimized, its square is also minimized therein. So let us just take this as a minimization of this. But this we know as a certain form, it is representable as an inner product. right? So what we are trying to do is minimize over x hat belonging to Rn the inner product of B minus A x hat with itself right which essentially means minimize B minus A x hat the whole transpose because we are dealing in the space of real vector spaces the field is real and this is B minus A x hat over x hat in Rn which is tantamount to minimization of x hat belonging to Rn. What is this whole object now? If you take the transposition of course the order gets flipped. So what comes out? It is B transposed B minus B transposed A x hat minus x hat transposed A transposed B plus x hat transposed A transposed A x hat. Now what are each of these? These are all scalars, real numbers. I put it to you that there is no difference between this object and this object. Would you agree? Because at the end of the day, these are all scalars. So if you take the scalars transpose, it is the scalar itself, real number, right? So if you take the transpose of this fellow, you get this. So there is absolutely no difference between these two objects. So I can just write this as instead minimization or x hat Rn. So this is the ultimate statement B transposed B minus twice x hat transposed or yeah let me just take the first term itself yeah twice B transposed A x hat plus x hat transposed A transposed A x hat. So now it is all about our ability to successfully evaluate the gradients of these objects and their hessians and to convince ourselves that whatever we will arrive at will indeed be a minima. Right? So I am going to erase this now. So of course this is just a scalar constant no matter what uh, quantity among the n tuples of x hat you take its partial with this is going to be 0. But what about this? Let us try and investigate what this object looks like. Yeah. So B transpose, so I am going to take a closer look at this B transposed A x hat is going to look like B transposed A1, A2 till A n x hat right that is going to be equal to B transposed A1, B transposed A2 till B transposed A n x hat which is nothing but x hat 1. So I hope you understand what this is, this is the first of the n tuples of x hat, the first entry of x hat. So this is B transposed A1 plus x2 hat B transposed A2 plus dot 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 till xn hat B transposed An. So this is a scalar. So it should not be too difficult to find out the gradient of this object now, right? So I am going to just take the gradient with respect to x hat of this whole object which is nothing but the gradient of this object which is nothing but the gradient of 
this object which is nothing but the gradient of this object and exactly what is it going to turn out to be? If I take the partial of this object with respect to x1 hat, it is just going to be this term, a scalar. So, that is the first of the n tuples. Yeah. So, this gradient if I write it as a column vector is going to turn out to be something like this, where the first term is B transposed A1, but I am going to do something here. Is B transpose A1 any different from A1 transpose B? No, right? So, I am going to just change it around a bit for very good reason for ease of representation. So, this is going to be similarly A2 transposed B till A n transposed B, right? So, is there a better way of writing this I wonder? Can I not write this as A1 transposed that is a row, A2 transposed that is also a row till A n transposed that is also a row times B, agreed? No doubts about this which is nothing but a transposed B, yeah, so far so good, right. Now, we have found out, we have figured that this when you take its gradient is 0. This object if you take its gradient, of course, that is only half of that because there is a 2 sitting here. So, we have seen what the gradient of this object turns out to be. Uh, I hope I can erase the first few lines here and just retain this line in pink here. Because now we are going to not entirely differentiate or take the gradient of this last term, but going to argue. Argue by what? Argue by the chain rule. What is the chain rule? This is going to be a quadratic in the axis, right? So first indulge me a bit and say that we are going to take this part as a constant and take the gradient for this and then so if you have for example x squared d d x you can do it in one shot and say it is 2 x but you can also say it is x times the d d x of x plus d d x of x times x which is just x times 1 plus 1 times x which is 2 x. So, I am going to use this argument. Why am I going to use this? Because I already know how to deal with this object courtesy of this, but I will have to repeat it twice because once I am going to keep treat this as a constant and take the gradient with respect to this treating this as a variable. The next time around I am going to treat this part as a constant and treat this as my variable, but again you see this is a symmetric thing. So, whatever I get as the gradient by treating this as a constant and this as a variable, it only needs to be doubled. But what is the form? You already identify with this with the form, right? This takes the role of B transposed, the A transpose A takes the role of A. So, would it be too much of a stretch if I were to just write in one shot? So please ask if there is any doubt. So, I am going to just write this here, sorry, x hat transposed a transposed a x hat because I have already done that work. I do not want to repeat that. This is very similar, is it not? So, I am just going to say this is nothing but 2 times what is this going to be? See, if you take the transpose of this fellow, this is now taking up the role of the a earlier, but this fellow is anyway symmetric whether you take its transpose or not does not matter. So, this is still going to be a transposed a hmm? and this x hat transposes the role paid, played by B transposed earlier. So, this is nothing, nothing but A transposed A x hat. Please take a breather here and see if you agree with this. See if this is obvious. If you agree that this is okay, then we will proceed. Is this all right? So, I am now going to take the gradient of this object here. Yeah. 
So I'm going to take the gradient of this object here. I'm going to apply the chain rule. First, I'm going to treat this as constant and take the gradient, treating this as the variable. Then I'm going to treat this as a constant and take the gradient, treating this as a variable. But both are one and the same. So if I do for one of those cases, I can just double it. But for one of those cases, I already know what it looks like because look at the uncanny similarity between this. This term is constant. This is the variable. If I treat this term as a constant and this as the variable, the forms are exactly the same. The role of A here is taken up by A transposed A here. The role of B transposed here is taken up by X hat transposed. So if I know the result in terms of this B transposed and A, I'm just going to supplant it here. So this is the role of A here, A transposed here. But because this is symmetric, this A transposed A, if you take the transposed of A transposed A, it's also A transposed A. So whether I take this transpose or not, in this case, it matters not. And this is the role played by B transposed, which comes here as B. The role played by X hat transposed here, which comes as X hat. So at the end of the day, if I'm saying that the gradient of this objective function that is, okay, let's get back to our A hacks, AX hat minus B, yeah, this is going to be squared. This is going to be equal to, remember I was missing a two out there, so that two has to come in with a minus sign. So it is minus two A transposed B plus 2 A transposed A X hat. Yeah. Right. Any doubts about this? So what must this be equated to? 0. That's the first order condition. So I need this to be equal to 0. But we still have a few questions to answer down the way because we don't yet know if certain inversions will be possible or not. We have to verify that. Right? So what we are aiming for, we can get rid of the 2 and we have A transposed A x hat is equal to A transposed B, right? So now I'm going to make a claim. I, I hope I can erase this part, right? So A transposed A, you agree, is a square matrix. Yeah, A is what? Size is M cross N. So A transposed is N cross M. A is M cross N, so N cross M, M cross N. That's N cross N. Yeah, square matrix. So it, it makes sense to ask about the invertibility of this without talking about left or right inverse. Just talking about the inverse of A transpose day. Why am I interested? Because if it is possible, then I ready-made have an answer to this. What is X hat? It's just A transpose A whole inverse times A transpose times B. Agreed? Okay. So we've seen that the question of invertibility essentially boils down to checking if the kernel of the matrix is trivial. Yeah. So claim A transposed A is invertible. All right. So if not, here's the proof. If not, there exists V not equal to zero such that A transposed A V is equal to zero. What is the size of V? Well, of course, N cross one. It has a non-trivial kernel. If it doesn't have an inverse, it means its columns are linearly dependent. Therefore, there must be a non-trivial combination of the columns of A transpose A which vanishes. But this also means whether you hit zero vector with a non-zero vector from the left or not, it still remains a zero. What does this remind you of? What sort of an object is that? Okay, but we know of something even better, right? 
we know of this as the inner product of AV with itself, is it not? Which in turn is nothing but the norm of AV being equal to 0, which means if something inside a norm is 0, that AV is 0. But is it possible? Remember our assumption? What assumption did we impose on A? Full column rank. So if A is full column rank, then at least as its columns are linearly independent. But now you are claiming if V is non-zero, that there is a non-trivial combination of the columns of A which vanishes. Clearly absurd, right? I hope it's clear, right? So I have not written clearly, but it's absurd. You agree? So if this is absurd, then what happens? It also implies that A transpose A has a trivial kernel only and therefore A transpose A is invertible. So this line of reasoning, this approach then works, then we can go ahead and say, once I have assured myself of the invertibility of A transpose A, I can just go ahead and say, this is A transpose A whole inverse times A transposed B, right? Which also means that B hat is now what? It is A x hat which is in turn equal to A, A transposed A inverse A transposed B. What do you think is the projection matrix in all of this? It is staring us in the face. What does the projection matrix do? It takes a fellow in a vector space, maps it to its subspace such that it is the best approximation in the subspace. Yeah. So what is that arbitrary vector which we plucked out and wanted to fit within the subspace? The arbitrary vector was B in Rm whose best approximation we wanted to find in the column span which has a dimension n. So an m dimension, a vector in an m dimensional a vector space had to be approximated in an n dimensional subspace of itself, right? So B hat is exactly that by our discussion of all of this. We haven't of course shown the positive definiteness of the Hessian that still remains to be seen. So let us also get that out of the way before we proceed further with this, but you already see that this matrix has the makings of a projection perhaps. We of course still need to verify those properties that we have imposed on orthogonal projection matrices, but we will check. I mean those are orthogonal projection maps, matrices just happen to be a special case. Already the linearity is quite clear. I mean at the end of the day with all those products and all what you end up with is a matrix and a matrix is known to be linear. So the linearity is anyway gone. But uh, uh, we want to first address the issue of the Hessian. So what do we need to prove? What do you think is, this is the gradient, right? Now if you want to take uh, another differentiation, what happens? What do you think will happen? It's going to be a matrix, right? And what are we going to be left with? So if I take, of this Ax hat minus B, this norm square. What do you think is going to happen? Any guesses? We have already done one, one differentiation. Then it should be easy to do the second differentiation of course, except for the fact that this is now a multivariable function. So you started with a scalar took the first differentiation, it ended up as a vector, take a second differentiation, it ends up as a, as a what? As a Jacobian, yeah. So what, what happens to this? Of course, this term even without glancing through this, it is a constant vector, does not matter what you take its derivative with respect to. What is the way to go about it? In general, if you have a vector and you want to take its differentiation with respect to another vector, what do you do? You take each entry in the vector 
I mean, those of you who have done a course on nonlinear control theory or whatever will encounter systems like x1 dot, x2 dot, till xn dot. This is f1, x1, xn. This is f2 of x1, x2, till xn. And this is fn, x1, x2, xn. So our popular way of ascertaining whether such a system of equations represents a stable dynamics around some equilibrium is to linearize it. And how do you linearize it? You linearize it by taking its partial. So what do we do? We take the partial of f1 with respect to x1, that's the first entry, f1 with respect to x2, that's the second entry. Yeah. So when we linearize this, we take f1, x1, f1, x2, so on. That's the first row of the Jacobian. Likewise, you cook up all the other rows. So this is exactly that, right? So it's a function of vectors being differentiated with respect to the vector of the axis. That's what you did here. Here also you're going to do the same thing. This you can treat like the function. Of course, the only difference is it's linear. It's even simpler, right? And now you take its derivative with respect to each individual entry. And you check that this comes out to be nothing but a transposed e. I mean, intuitively it might be very obvious. It looks very similar to a scalar differentiation in that if you have something times x, it just sheds the x. But what's going on at the heart of it is essentially that sort of an operation, right? So I want you to just write it up in some detail. Yeah, you can replace this A transpose day with any P, Q, R, any matrix, R, X. So if you, if you want to simplify the notation, you just take R, X hat and you take its, you know, this is a, uh, a vector. So you differentiate this, you take its Jacobian with respect to X hat. Yeah, that's all that this is going to be. And you'll, you'll be left with only R. Probably R transposed. If, yeah, probably R transposed. But then in this case, the transposition matters not. Okay? So, no, it will probably, no, it will probably be R. Anyway, we'll have to check. But anyway, in this case, it matters not because this is symmetric. I mean, the two really, again, for purpose of our checking, we want to ascertain that this object is positive definite and two is just a positive number. Yeah, there will be a two. So, now we have to check for the positive definiteness of this. So, we are asking, is this object positive definite? So, before that, we have to understand what is this notion of positive definiteness? Yeah. When do we say that a matrix is positive definite? So let's just define that. So this part is clear. We have actually gone ahead and pushed our luck a bit and predicted that this is going to be a projection matrix. We are yet to show that. All right. So here's the definition. Uh, matrix P is equal to P transposed in R n cross n is said to be positive definite if for all v not equal to 0, v transposed p v which is a scalar is going to be strictly positive. That's the definition of a positive definite matrix. There are several equivalent conditions to check for a positive definite matrix, one of which entails eigenvalues and eigenvectors, eigenvalues in fact, something we have not yet covered, but we will in some time. But for now, this is just what the definition is. So if you're given a symmetric matrix, you just have to try it with different, different vectors in this Rn and check that this object, if this turns out to be positive. Of course, if you choose this to be 0, it's going to be 0. So that is out of the question. We will only concentrate on non-zero vectors. Yes, you had a question? Yes, yes, exactly. All right. 
So for non-symmetric, uh, you can sort of massage it into a symmetric matrix by talking about A plus A transposed half thereof and take a quad. It is all about the quadratic form that comes out as a result, you see. So if you can come up with a, if you have a non-symmetric matrix to start with and if you can come out with an equivalent symmetric matrix that also does the job for you. So for example, if you have uh, x1 squared plus 2x1 x2 plus x2 squared, you can just go ahead and write this as x1 x2, that is x transpose for you and then this is 1 1, yeah, 1 1. So I am not claiming this is positive definite but this definitely gives you a quadratic form. In fact, this is not positive definite, can you tell me why? Because if you just choose x1 and x2 to be negatives of one another, opposites, inverses of one another, additive inverses, it vanishes. So even for a vector which is not 0, this vanishes. And you can also look at this matrix, that is also another equivalent condition, this has to be a full rank in case of a positive definite matrix. But this has a non-trivial kernel and that kernel is exactly what is spoiling the party. So this is something that we call as positive semi-definite, okay, because it is non-negative for sure this quadratic form can never be negative because it is x1 plus x2 whole squared. Now this same object someone can write as, uh, let me see, 1, 2, 1, uh, sorry, 0, 1, I hope this works, yeah, but this is not symmetric. So the trick is if you want, the essential check is for a quadratic function, for a quadratic expression. If you are given that quadratic expression in terms of a matrix that is not symmetric, just go ahead and convert it to a symmetric corresponding matrix and then it is easy to check whether the quadratic form is positive definite or not based on whether the matrix sitting in the middle is positive definite or not and there are several checks for that. One of the checks is of course the first condition is for a symmetric matrix all eigenvalues. We have not gone there but I am just predicting ahead. All eigenvalues are going to be real and therefore if you have all your eigenvalues to be positive real then it is going to be a positive definite matrix, okay. We will do all those proofs in some time once we are through with the idea of eigenvalues and so on. So the idea is that maybe checking for a quadratic like this may not be so straightforward but there are equivalent conditions for checking for the positive definite of the matrix. Now if you can ascertain that the matrix is positive definite then of course a quadratic form represented by like so through that matrix is always going to be positive definite. So check the positive definiteness of a function like this through the verification of the positive definiteness of a matrix. Okay. Here of course we are only interested in whether this matrix is positive definite or not, right. So with this definition in mind, with this definition in mind, let us say suppose not, what happens? Look at any consider any, actually we do not need to consider suppose not but okay that is <laughs> just a good way to start any argument. So we have not talked about sizes, okay let us take n tuple, yeah A transpose A is obviously n squared so it is n cross n, okay. Then V transposed A transposed A V is equal to what? We have already seen this just a while back when we proved invertibility. This is nothing but the square of the norm of A V. And can this ever be 0 for any non-zero V? So of course I must restrict my V to be non-zero because we are only going to check over non-zero vectors. Yeah. So what about this? Is this certain to be positive? Yeah. So we have a contradiction. We assumed it is not, of course. <laughs> I mean, I could not, I could have just omitted that step and just two, three lines. But because I have written that step, now the onus is on me to also complete it by saying, oh, it is a contradiction. So therefore, A transpose A, the Hessian turns out to be positive definite and therefore, whatever solution that we have obtained is indeed a minimizer of the problem at hand, right. 
Okay. Yes? No, A transpose isn't equal to A. But this is just the inner product form, right? A V is inner product with itself like we wrote just a while back. So that is nothing but the square of the norm of A V. And A V cannot vanish because A is full column rank. So A has a trivial right null space or kernel. So therefore this for any non-zero V cannot vanish. And because this is norm, it's positive. Square of the norm is of course going to be positive. So therefore, this conclusion, right? So now, since we have assured ourselves that we have a solution to the problem we started with, let us look at b hat given by a, a transposed a inverse, which is guaranteed to exist, a transposed b. So linearity I put it to you is checked. Linearity of what exactly? Linearity of this object. Because this is now what I'm going to claim as a P, the projection matrix. Right? Linearity is verified. What do I need? Idempotence. Just go ahead and check. So A a transposed A inverse A transposed times A, A transposed A inverse A transposed times and merge these terms together. Whether you pulverize it with this or this matters not. This is A transposed A, some Q, this Q inverse. So what you'll be left with is equal to A, A transposed A inverse A. So idempotence is also verified. Yeah, sorry, A transposed, right you are. All right, what else do we need to check? That the image of this must be equal to what? Where is it approximating to? The column span of A. So, column span of A is equal to image of this P that I've defined there. Right? So we'll see that in the upcoming module.